So folks, welcome to the Isolation Bible Study. I'm Bill Tucker at Concordia in San Antonio. Pastor Zach is uh, on some much-deserved R&R uh, with his family, and we hope he, they're having a great time and getting some relaxation in. It's a good family time together. And so to, to help us out and to make sure that I don't goof this whole thing up in the meantime, we have one of my very, very favorite teachers, one of my very favorite pastors in the world, Dr. Tom Zelt from uh, Fremont, California. And if that name sounds familiar, Dr. Zelt has been at Concordia and, in fact, was the, the guy who was going to lead our expedition to Israel this past spring that got canceled. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to get it in this next spring. But, Tom, welcome to the Isolation Bible Study. So good to, to be with you today. Thanks so much. It's uh, it's really a privilege. And I, I would say uh, I totally always appreciate uh, working with you, uh, Bill, and, and the and just the joy of the Lord and the wisdom that you share. It's uh, its always really wonderful. So thanks for asking me to be part of this today. I, see, I want you to come back. Zach never says nice things like that, Tom. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. Well, he's just down the hall from you, so come on now. It's, uh, <laughs> he knows the truth more more intimately. Well, Tom, one of the things that I, that I loved when we were talking and getting ready, and you had offered a couple of different topics that, that we might talk about, but one that I think is Number one, it ties really nicely with, with what we're trying to talk about this weekend in the message. We're doing this series uh, called Reopening Christianity. We're asking some really tough questions, not about Christianity reopening, right, but, but about how we can be more focused on who we're supposed to be, who we're called to be. Uh, and the topic you suggested was God's gift in the power of words. Yeah, yeah. So take it away, brother. Lead us. Yeah. Lead uh, this just really has hit me uh, a lot recently, and maybe it's just a spirit's conviction of my own failures in this area. Uh, but we all know, we all know the power of words, and whether we say it out loud or not, we just, we just know. You could hear, you could have a great day, and then somebody could say something to you at the end of the day, and all of a sudden, it just kills you. Um, and so, it, thinking about that, working through the scripture on that. Uh, it, as you go through the word, man, boy, God puts a lot of weight on the power of words. Uh, and, and it, uh, as, as the more you, you think about it, I mean, here's, you know, here's one, Proverbs 18, 21. It's a, it's a great kind of passage to, to uh, get us jumped off at. Proverbs 18, 21 says, the tongue has the power of life and death. Wow, that, that I mean, puts so much weight on what we can do with our mouths in the words that come out. The, the tongue is the power of life and death. Yeah, I mean, does that ever bring it home with crystal clarity? And, and we think about it, because it, literally a command from, from someone can bring death to people. But, you know, Tom, as I think about the, those words, I think about people that I've known who have had They've, they've grown up or they've had been in abusive situations and relationships in one way or another, and it has literally crushed their spirit. It's, it's driven them to a point of depression or despair where they struggle to even survive. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, you, you know, kind of looking at, well, just even from the, um, the secular world, apart from the scripture and, and you look at that and you, and you, uh, University of Arizona did a study about how many words, you know, and there's always this myth that, you know, uh, women speak more words than men. By the way, that's not true. We, we speak about the same amount of words between 16 and 17,000 words a day. But uh, the, the studies from using that, the language has a physiological effect on us. And, and we know this because we experience it. You know, there are certain words that, that hook our fear centers, like in our amygdala and other places producing stress, uh, stress producing hormones. Um, one study recently is people that have grown up in a situation in which uh, harsh words and mean words and bullying words are used. And this to me is just, it blows me away. And that is that it actually even can affect our genetic makeup. Uh, and, and that's so strange to me because, you know, growing up, you go like, there was the whole thing about Lamarck genetics or Mendelian uh, genetics. And you go like, yeah, your environment doesn't affect your genetics. And what they're finding out is that's not true that our DNA is actually even affected by this. And so when you hear these words of God, the tongue is the power for life or death. Boy, the, we know that from an experiential side. 
but from a physiological side and from study side, boy, it's becoming more and more obvious that that is that is very true. It's interesting, Tom, and I don't know I don't know that the study did this, but it's it's amazing to me as our culture becomes more oriented toward social media and uh, and interactions at distance and so forth. It, it seems to me that that some of the some of the implications and effect of social media on people where they where instead of making them feel better, they actually feel worse because they feel like they're missing out on things or their life isn't as good as other people. In, in my mind, that kind of all ties together, doesn't it? It's, yeah. Yeah. it's stuff that we're taking in that can be incredibly, that is incredibly powerful, can be in a positive way or can be in a, in a really profoundly bad way. Right, right. And even the, it's kind of funny, uh, nothing really changes as, or, or as time goes by, you know, in the, in the ancient world, uh, pharaohs or emperors or kings, you don't put on your, on your palace walls the times that you just got beat up. You just don't put, yeah, boy, we went into that battle, we got throttled. I mean, you know, it, it, they don't say that. What they do is they post the highlights of their life. And mm -hmm. so often on Facebook, et cetera, social media, we post the highlights of our life. And we start looking at that, we go like, well, my life doesn't come anywhere near their highlights. Uh, and so as a result, we just, inadvertently and, and, you know, subliminally almost, we just get this negative, instead of just rejoicing in the goodness, we just begin sometimes to, to fill the void in our own life from looking at what other people have said. Uh, it's, it's so uh, this, the power of words and the, the, uh, one of the passages that, I, that I really love about this, cause words are hard. I mean, they really are hard. Uh, how many times have we, I said something and I know what I meant, but the other person didn't understand that at all, or they took it in a way that I didn't mean it. Um, and, and so just the, the challenge of using words underneath it, um, Romans 14, verse 19. I love this passage because it's let us pursue that which leads to peace and building up. That to me is so critical because words are hard. But the, the question then is going to be, what am I pursuing? It's kind of the attitudinal underlying way in which I approach words. Am I pursuing, am I really seeking after this, that which is going to build up? That's going to affect, you know, how I use words or how I listen and, and all that stuff, if that's my pursuit. Uh, because words, words are tricky, you know, there's a perception of the here and there's the, there's the eye rolling of the, or the body language or the tone and, uh, and all that. How many times have, have we, you know, written an email and sent it and then go, oh, well, I didn't mean that or received an email and then like, well, they didn't mean that either, but I took it that way and, and it created angst and stuff like that. So this passage from Romans, let's pursue that which leads to peace and builds up. Uh, so underlyingly critical to m how I address the whole issue of communication and words in a godly way. I was just looking at uh, up that same passage from Romans 14 verse 19 in the New Living Translation. And it's, it's kind of interesting how they phrase it. So let us, so then let us aim for harmony in the church. Same, same idea, right? Aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. Uh, and it, it's really convicting because I think about how often we're, we're aiming for something else, yes. right? And it connects with the, the, the idea that I was mentioning about our sermon series. So this weekend, the question is, am I known for what I'm for? Or am I known for what I'm against? Uh, and, and that the whole idea, Jesus was for everybody. He was for people. It's part of what, what caused people to want to be around him and to, to be there. And we're doing John chapter 8, you know, where, where the woman is brought before him in adultery. All of those people, it says at dawn, gathered around him because he was there for them. They, he talked to them. He treated them well. He cared for them. He was respectful. He, he built them up. Yeah. You know, when I think about the, the people that, that I love to be around, they're people who build me up. Tom, one of the reasons you're, you're my favorite teacher is because every time I listen to what you have to say, it builds me up. I'm strengthened. My faith is strengthened. My knowledge is improved. If, when that's our aim, lots of good things can happen. Yeah, I wish I wish that was always my aim. <laughs> We're doing a, a series called Barnabas Habits, 
uh, uh, which is just encouraging ministry to do that. And, and I love the fact that that's not even his name. That's his nickname. You know, his real name is Joseph and, and Barnabas. And I think, what kind, of, what kind of guy must this have been for the nickname to have been son of encouragement? Yeah. You know, that guy that you see walking across the campus and you look at him and you're like, there he is. And you're so glad to see him because every time you see him, you're just lifted up. Makes me think of my dad, Tom. My, so my dad's name was Herbert, but his nickname and the name that most people knew him by was Hap because he was always happy from the time he was a little boy until the time he went to heaven, he was a happy guy. So kind of the same thing, right? This Barnabas, literally every word that came out of his mouth must have made people feel like they were walking on clouds. Yeah, yeah. He's a guy, yeah, that's what Paul's preaching away or talking away and somebody falls out of the window asleep and he's like, preach it, Paul. I mean, you know, <laughs> that kind of guy. It's just so, so supportive of it. One of the passages that... Um, as I've been looking at the, the power of words is the James three passage, which uh, it's, it's so powerful. And um, we've had a bunch of, I'm out in California. And so we've had a bunch of fires and uh, it's, it's been hugely devastating fires, but this picture from James three, it says in verse five, last half of verse five, consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body, it corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. You think, wow, <laughs> that's powerful words, yeah. It is very powerful. We had the, the uh, it's called the camp fire, it wasn't a campfire, but there was a uh, down pg e lines, uh, that's our uh, you know, gas and electric. And, uh, and, and the two years ago up there. And I, so I thought, I wonder how bad, you know, really that fire, one of the things that just blew me away as I was looking at that was that that fire uh, started with down power lines at just a brush fire. And there was a 40 mile an hour wind that just blew that thing crazy. And it ultimately was, it's been the worst fire in California history. Over 18,000 buildings were destroyed. I was listening to one guy talk about it. It spread at the, the size of a football field every second. Can you imagine being a, a hundred yards away, you know, a hundred yards away and the fire is a hundred yards away and that, that's one second. And the next second you're in the middle of it. I, I remember hearing those, that very statistic and seeing some of the pictures it, because before that, you know, I was always kind of amazed thinking, why didn't these people get out? You know, how did they not respond to this? But when you realize it's traveling like that. You can see it off in the distance and think you're fine. And 15 seconds later, it's enveloped you. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. And so th this word from James about, you know, the little, the power that we have with their tongue. I mean, you know, it's a spark. He says it's a spark that can start something. And, and, then, it, and then in, you know, a second, it'll envelop a uh, hundred yards more. And I, man, have we ever experienced that in our life where we, a little spark comes out and the next thing you know, I've started a wildfire and, and you know, just devastating people, uh, you know, even unthinkingly. That's why this pursue that which builds up or makes harmony in, in the church is so critical uh, just because it can happen so fast. And we all have that capability with our, with our words. You know, I think of, I think of, that again in the context of the interactions that people have. And, you know, there, there are some folks who, who would never think of saying harsh or ugly things to someone in person, but they'll, they'll type it in social media or they'll type it in a tweet or uh, they'll, they'll put it out there in a video because it seems less personal maybe. And I can't tell you how many relationships have been damaged. And oftentimes you don't even know that you damaged that relationship. There was a there was a conversation with we were talking with our kids on Father's Day, and there was an interaction that happened between two people that was overheard by a third person, completely separate. But that that conversation that happened in kind of a cavalier way and was insensitive about some very personal sorts of issues, created this huge distance. It, it, it literally destroyed a relationship, kind of like this forest fire that we're talking about, right? destroyed this relationship because it was carelessly spoken and and rude yeah yeah 
it's in it it's it's um i mean again the power of the weight of words that god puts uh, or the weight that god puts on words so so big they uh staying in the word in, in ephesians 4 at the end of that chapter verse 29 says says this do not let any, any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs then it may benefit those who listen uh, that the word unwholesome the greek word for unwholesome talk this is the niv 1972 version but uh, the greek word is saprón and the the word saprón really means rotting like a fruit that would rot uh, so, you know, I, th I think about that and I think, well, I have the, the capability, unfortunately, of speaking like a bacteria into somebody's life that's going to create rotting in, in their life. Uh, don't let any of that rotting type of stuff come out of your mouth that can go into another person's life and cause, cause decay, uh, which is just exactly what you're, you're talking about. Amazing. It's such amazing clarity. Because we live in a we live in a world. I mean, I mean, again, when it says "let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth," man, I'm convicted, right? I think, what in the world am I thinking? And especially when you realize what that word picture is and what it what it does and what it causes, it's not as if it doesn't matter. It's not as if our words are simply throwaways that that may have impact or may not. Uh, they do matter. Yeah. God's saying they have an impact. They affect people's lives. Yeah. And, and I think we've experienced that. that. You know, the idea of wholesome talk used to be a, a valued thing in our culture. But now the rhetoric of insults, uh, you know, you, you speak in such a way to garner a vote or to whatever it is, you know, and it doesn't matter how harsh or how mean or whatever it is, the insults that, that are just accepted and come out. I, I mean, it has an effect on our culture. And, and I think we can see that. Um, its impact and I think how different we could be uh, as as believers in Jesus who value this and say you know I have the ability I have not only the ability to start a forest fire to create rotting but I also have the ability to build up to bring grace into somebody's life that's the last half of that verse um, you know where it says only that which is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit them word benefit there I don't know what's your translation for that word benefit there See where we at, Tom? Verse 29, 429. Yeah, 429. So mine says, so the words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Uh, yeah. I, it's, it's interesting because I, uh, I just got two letters. Uh, one two days ago, one today. Uh, and they're from from dear people in the congregation. One person is, is very frustrated by musical choices in a, in a particular service. Another person was just so grateful that they were able to, to listen to the service uh, even though they're not able to be in church. Now, one of them, I thought, okay, man, I'm sorry. Don't know what I can do about it, right? It's it's over and done. The other, I thought, wow, thank you so much, Mrs. So and So. You made my day. Yeah. Yeah. They're very, they're very. I have no idea what you're talking about there on those musical choices, those letters about oh, that. No. So and so. <laughs> see once in a while. So yeah. Yeah. So th this idea that we can speak grace, and in fact, that's uh, uh, the word that's there, charas, it's the word grace, that you may speak grace into somebody's life. And you mentioned uh, Jesus with that here in, in, in uh, John 8. He's got uh, the woman thrown at his feet, and he pauses, he stops, and says, you're going to be talking about this. But then finally, when he speaks, it's just such a word of grace that's unexpected to her. How, uh, you know, you, you get... Jesus walking along, he looks up and there's a guy in a tree and he says, hey, I got to go to your house today. Uh, where nobody else would, even, the crowd wouldn't even let him into the group. They didn't want him in the group. Totally rejected. Yeah, totally rejected. And Jesus just goes, hey, I got to go to your house. And what a great word that he speaks there to lift him up. 
um, you know, he's asked, you know, you can make me better if you want to. And Jesus, if I want to, <laughs> yes, I want to. And, and what a great word of love and acceptance. And so, um, you know, and, and this passage is, it says, you know, we're committed to this because uh, as, it, as it goes, it goes, others according to their needs. So the idea that I'm going to, I'm going to care enough to really become familiar with what would build them up. How do I need to say this? What's the, what do I need to listen for so that I could speak a word that builds up? And it may not even be a word. It may just be presence. Uh, but I, I care enough that I'm going to use my words as the blessing God wants me to use uh, in that situation. So on John 8, as this woman is, is I mean, she's, she knows she's, she's in the midst of it, right? She has been caught. The whole thing is a bizarre trap, and, and we don't need to get into all of that necessarily. But there's no question she's guilty. She's humiliated. She's embarrassed. And, and there's that moment where Jesus is going to say something that's either going to absolutely crush her spirit or give her hope. And isn't it wonderful? Neither do I condemn you. The only one who had the right to says, I don't condemn you. Yeah. Believes that she can she can be different, believes that she can, you know, live a, a life that's wholesome and positive and good. And, and he speaks that into her. Right. Oh, that. And, and it's just the reverse of that. Speaking a word that creates decay or rotting. Uh, it's in fact, it's it's as Proverbs said, you know, you have the it's the power of life or death. And, and so he speaks that, that word into her life. Wow, how awesome. And I get to I get to be a partner with God in order to speak that same word into people's lives. So so say that again, Tom, because that is really a cool thought. As we're going around with the various interactions and places where we can make expression of our thoughts and sentiments. We get to be a partner with God in speaking that into people's lives. So cool. So literally the things, the things that God would want to say to them, he lets us be part of communicating that. Isn't that crazy? That's crazy. And it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. And, and uh, I mean, it's not a surprise then you, you look at, um, you know, what, what, what do they call Jesus? What word did they pick out for Jesus before, uh, before um, he became incarnate? And John says, what was the word of God? He, God wanted to speak something into our lives. And he wanted to speak that grace um, that comes through Jesus. Uh, he wants to communicate that, that to our world. He wants to communicate that to me and to each of us. And so I get to be that word, if you will, uh, that's spoken into people's lives. You know, it's also interesting to me, Tom, because when we think about that that rotting, right, that 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 infection that we can spread to someone else by virtue of our words, I think we also need to recognize it's not just doing its damage in the life of that other person. If if those thoughts and those expressions are what are coming out of us, we're at risk as well. There's a real danger going on inside of our own heart and soul and mind. Yeah. Uh, out of the out of the treasures of the heart, the mouth speaks, Jesus says. He said it's in Luke 17 and then in Matthew and, and he just out of the house. And I think, well, words then are really windows into what's going on in our heart. And if our heart is filled with this incredible grace of God, boy, they look through our words to see our heart. They're, they're, our words are a window into what's really on the inside of us. Uh, and so the idea that when they hear those words, they, they're seeing it is this person filled with grace and uh, overflowing with this incredible gift of God's love for us. So Tom, what would you, what's your advice? How do we make this practical, right? This is all, this is all good to understand. It gives us context and framework and understanding it. But if I struggle, if I'm struggling with, with wholesome talk, if I'm struggling to, to be that Barnabas to the people around me, where do I begin? <laughs> ah, that's a great question. I guess, you know, one is first awareness of it. 
second is in this idea of what really does motiv motivate me. And, you know, s some people, and, and you, we all know this, that, that, that some people aren't happy unless they're mad. Uh, and so you're just kind of going through the day waiting for that thing that's going to make you mad. And if that's the case, I mean, the self-evaluation that's led by the spirit to go like, wait a second, am I really pursuing building people up? Or am I just waiting for that, that one reason, whatever it might be, in order to be upset with somebody? Uh, but that just kind of that self-reflective, self-evaluation, prayer time being you know, led by the spirit of God to let this word go like, huh, am I pursuing that? And and then, uh, you know, so often our, our, our speaking habits, our choice of words are, are ones that, uh, you know, we've lived with for a lot of time and we have certain characteristics or traits or uh, whether it's DNA or nurture and to just evaluate that on the sense of, is this, does this really build up? Is there a tone I use? Is there a body language I have? Um, and, and to be a real sensitive to that, to say, I want to get better in this, to speak God's grace. That's, that's kind of where we started, right? And it's, I think that's a great, great point. It really begins with what we're aiming at. Yeah. If, we're, if we're aiming at harmony, if we're aiming at building people up, then the chance of that happening goes up exponentially, right? Yeah. If we're aiming at something else, the chances of actually building people up become incidental. Yeah. Now, one other thing that I, that's on my mind, because I know we're running out of time here, uh, but this has been cool, and it's, it's helpful and convicting and powerful for me. I'm sure it is for the folks who are with us. Tom, there's a tendency in our lives when someone says something to us that's positive. There are lots of us who have a tendency to kind of push that to the side and not hold on to that. But when someone says something negative, we let it, we let it go all the way to our soul, right? We let it so let true. it go. Yes. I think we have a We've got, to, we've got to have an understanding of who we are in the sight of God to try and help change that around. So we're clinging to the things that are encouragements, and we're dismissing those things that are destructive. Don't yeah. you think? Yo, oh, absolutely. Uh, and that's so hard because, you know, why do those things cling so closely? Why do they hit so hard? Uh, might be we feel insecure, you know, and, or we might feel guilty. And when they bring those things up, it's like, I'm trying so hard not to be guilty, but it, but it just, it just you know, hooks those things in us so quickly. Uh, so being centered in Christ, saying, well, that's who I am. Um, and God's, God's grace is abundant in my life. Um, and, and, and hanging on to that, you know, being centered there so that when we hear those words, though they might hurt, we might say, okay, if I, if I failed, I'm going to receive forgiveness and, and, um, just just again striving for that what builds up I, it's just it's a challenge it really is you know one of the things we talk a lot about is the the importance of having accountability partners and that that's really a, a critical part of the christian life that you have folks that that can speak into your life and can speak to you honestly about things that that you know love you that their whole mission is to love and encourage you and an accountability partner could play a really critical role in this issue, because if we're talking about those things that are wounding us and damaging us, they can help put that into, into context when maybe we can't on our own. It, it hits too close to home or it touches on something that we feel insecure about. And those are folks who can maybe help us say, wait a minute, you're not seeing the whole picture. Right. Bring us back to that sort of broader perspective of who we are and who God has called us to be. Uh, get us right. back. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think um, uh, the fact that, you know, in the Old Testament, when God had had uh, people gather for worship, God always said, hey, I want to have the last word. And, and, and the last word was not, hey, go out there and do better. The last word was not his, his last word he wanted to speak over says, I bless you. I keep you. I smile on you. I give you my favor. I mean, that whole thing is because God wants that to be the last word. Uh, the, that he speaks. I mean, the, the word that just resonates in our ears all the time, that God is, a God who gives us this blessing in his favor. What a great thought that is. I think that's just about, we're just about at the end of our time, but I love that. God wants the last word not to knock us down. He wants the last word to make sure that as we are leaving that time of worship, he, we know he loves us. Yeah. He blesses us. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. 
Uh, thank you so much. I, I, I hope we have you back on here again, because like I said, you blessed me and I know you've blessed other folks, uh, but God bless you in, uh, in California with all the things. And as you open worship this weekend for the first time, hope it's wonderful and amazing. Thanks, brother. Sure enjoyed it. Appreciate it. Folks, I want to remind you of something else. We have our shoe drive. One of the things that is in a tremendous need at the, the agencies that serve the homeless here in San Antonio are athletic shoes. And so there is a, a box for gathering those shoes out underneath the cross so you don't have to encounter anyone. You don't have to get close to anybody else. But if you would take a few minutes to bring those athletic shoes that are just tucked away in your closet that are no longer of use to you, they will be a blessing to somebody else. Bring those by and drop them off. Uh, we need them by Friday because we then need to transition them and get them into folks' hands. So we'd love to have you be part of that. Uh, if you're planning to worship at Concordia this weekend, be sure and register. You got an email from me yesterday. It's got the link. Uh, if you have any trouble with that, just leave us a message here in the, in the comments. We'll help you get squared away. But we hope you have a great day. God bless you. Tom, thanks again. Look forward to seeing you again very soon. You're welcome.